In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, we know it. We've been encouraged. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Is that all right? Again, I want to say from this morning, far too often, you and I allow the circumstances and conditions in this life to define who we are. And therefore, oftentimes we grow comfortable in living in fear and defeat to a point where even uh, we convince our own selves that we are incapable. We allow ourselves to be defined. Get this now. We allow ourselves to uh, be defined by, by what has happened to us or by what has not happened for us. But again, the truth of the matter is, and what you and I, for our own selves, must come to discover, is the fact that what has happened to us is not at all a reflection of who we are. Some of us have been abandoned. Some of us have been abused. Some of us have been rejected. Some of us have been left for dead. But God has saw fit for us to still be here. Amen, somebody. And just as we learned in our lesson last week, our earthly condition is not at all a reflection of our spiritual position. And therefore, in Christ Jesus, you and I have been called out of fear and unto faith. And that's why I want to call your attention back to the book of Judges briefly this afternoon. The book of Judges chapter 6. Where this morning we already examined the first three critical points from this lesson. This great lesson of Gideon in relation to being called out of fear and unto faith. And we want to conclude this afternoon with the final two points. But again, in recapping, because I really want to set the tone for this, in recapping the first three points this morning, just briefly, if you allow me to, the first point again from this morning is the fact that God uses tough times to get our attention. Amen, somebody. Judges chapter 6, verse 1, again says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Notice this. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of Midian for seven years. You say, why would God do that? God has a purpose for everything he does. Is that all right? Verse 6 says, So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. You see, God didn't punish them in the fact that they were killed and all these things. He just allowed the Midianites to squat on their land. In other words, everything that they would have, the Midianites would take. And as I said this morning, this is the worst type of oppression. I'd rather somebody just do something horrible to me and just leave it at that. But when you have to live in a situation for years on end, amen, somebody, that's the worst type of thing because you're trying to get away from it. It's almost like you're just hemmed in. You can't go nowhere. You can't do nothing. You can't breathe. Amen, somebody. This was the type of oppression that they were under. Is that all right? As we said this morning, it's interesting to note, though, that as we open the book of, or this chapter, particularly in Judges 6, we find the nation of Israel coming off of a time where they had relative ease. Get this, don't miss this point. In other words, as we said this morning, the bills are paid, the kids are behaving, and business is good. Amen, somebody. Everything's coming up roses. And as it, it tends to happen to all of us, because we get in these situations where things are pretty good, right? Israel forgot the Lord God. And there's sometimes, amen, somebody, if we're honest, there's sometimes when things are going relatively easy in our lives where we forget God. Amen. They became self-sufficient. Believing that they didn't need God. 
So the Lord, notice, because of his great love, all right, he shook things up, raising their enemies against them just to show them how hard and how difficult life truly is without him. And God loves you and I enough to shake us up and show us that you're not doing nothing by yourself. You need me. Is that all right? Again, notice, it took them seven years to cry out to the Lord. And as I said this morning, why so long? Maybe they were a lot like us. They waited until uh, they exhausted every possible option that they could do on their own until they couldn't take it no longer. And many times we do the same thing. Amen, somebody. We try to exhaust every option, everything that we can do, until we find out that, guess what? There's nothing that I can do to help out this situation. I need the Lord. Amen, somebody. And it teaches us in the future that when we do have problems, when tough times do come, to call on God first. Don't wait. Is that all right? Again, you and I must learn that every experience in life is a test. And every trial in the lives of God's people, notice this, every trial in the lives of God's people is divinely tailored to draw us closer to him. And therefore, when tough times do come, instead of looking at them as if God is punishing us, we must learn to try and see them as God's gift of grace. Yes, I said it. You said, look at troubles as God's gift of grace. Absolutely. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3 in the verses 11 and 12, do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his discipline. Notice verse 12, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Just as a father, the son he delights in. In other words, God loves you too much to let you keep living the way you are. He longs to be the center of our lives. All right? So he has divine designs in all of our troubles. And get this, they're always, always for our good. Is that all right? The second point this morning was, God always sees more than we do. Is that all right? Verse 12 again in Judges 6 says, And the angel of the Lord, even in this situation, even in the situation where Gideon and his people were living in oppression, they were living in fear, they were living in hiding, the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And there's some hellish situations that you and I are in in our lives right now, and we don't even understand. We don't even know that God is with us. Amen, somebody. He said, the Lord is with you. Then he said to him, you mighty man of valor. Is that all right? Notice again in verses 13 through 15. Gideon said to him, and this is just us, you and I today, amen. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And we question God, too, don't we? If God is with me, then why is my life in a, such disarray? Why is it so toxic? Why is it so dysfunctional? Is that all right? Okay. Then he says, and where is all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now, look at his mindset. Look at his attitude. All right. But now the Lord has forsaken us. And sometimes, if we're honest, we, we think that God has forsaken us and left us for dead. All right? But remember, God said, I will never forsake you. I will never abandon you. Is that what he said? All right? And he says, forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Notice then, then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours. Did y'all get that? Right after he tried to make excuses of why God wasn't with them, the Lord didn't even acknowledge his excuses. And sometimes you and I give excuses, and God ain't trying to hear that. Amen, somebody. He said, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Here come another excuse. Indeed, my clan, notice his mindset now. Indeed, my clan, 
or my family is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am, I am, notice how he views him as his own self. I am the least in my father's house. Again, the point is God sees, amen, God sees even when you and I can't see. Because he sees what he's able to do through us. And therefore, God knows who you and I are, even if we don't. You say, man, I ain't been nothing all my life. I haven't achieved anything. I haven't gotten an education. I haven't gotten this. Amen, somebody. But God is not a, a, a respecter of persons. Is that all right? God knows who you are, even if you and I don't. And he will work to help you and I come to truly discover and to see our true identity. Far too long we have allowed things in this life to define who we are. All right. Then the third point was this before we go on. The third point was private faithfulness is essential to public usefulness. Did y'all get that? Private faithfulness is essential to public usefulness. Again, verses 25 through 33 to 32 says, Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, talking to Gideon, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and notice what he tells him to do. Tear down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. You see, his own family, again, as I stated this morning, his own family was breaking the first and second commandment of the law of Moses. All right? They had other gods before him. That's the, that's the first commandment. Thou shalt not have other gods before me, false gods before me. Second law was thou shalt not make graven images. They were breaking both of these. Is that all right? Verse 26 says, and... After you tear them down and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement. And take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants, notice this, and did as the Lord had said to him. He did what God told him to do. But notice this, but... Because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it in by the day, he did it at night. You said, well, well, he's still kind of fearful, but he still did it. Is that all right? The point again is this. Before God can use you and I publicly, he must first be magnified faithfully in our lives privately. In other words, get this now, get this. God cannot work mightily through one who's faithfulness to him is minimal okay and therefore if you and I truly want to learn to trust God or how to trust God we must do so first by setting our own house in order amen somebody which brings us to our final two points this afternoon in relation to being called from fear and unto faith notice the fourth point is this God is patient with our faith process. God is patient with our faith process. Look with me in the verses 15 through 24. Verse 15 says, So he said to him, again, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, If I have now found favor in your sight. Now look at what Gideon is saying to God. After God told him what he would do, I will be with you. You're going to strike the Midianites. You're going to save Israel. All right. But that's not enough. Notice what Gideon says. If I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talks with me. You see, we must be mindful, mindful before we get 
uh, uh, beside ourselves with Gideon and saying, oh, he ain't faithful, he ain't listening to God. We have to understand how overwhelming and impossible of a task this must have been for Gideon, considering the great number of the Midianites. They were way outnumbered. Amen, somebody. All right? Notice he continues in verse 18. He says, Gideon, speaking to the Lord, do not depart from here. I pray until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait till you come back. So Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot. And he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on the, upon this rock. Pour out the broth, and he did so. Notice verse 21. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. The fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Now, why is this significant? Because it shows that this was accepted by God and that this had to be God. Are y'all getting that? And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Because they knew that if they looked at the Lord face to face, they would die. Amen, somebody. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. To this day, it is still an Ophrah of the Abyssalites. Amen, somebody. The point is this. Gideon needed a personal encounter with God. And sometimes you and I, when we're dealing with our family, our friends, and things like that, and we're trying to encourage them in the Lord. We're trying to get them uh, to see how good God is. We have to realize we can't manufacture faith in people. They have to have their own experience with God. They have to come know God for themselves. Amen, somebody. Gideon needed a personal encounter with God. And guess what? God met Gideon right where his faith was and giving him a sense of peace and reassurance by his presence. And why is that so important? Because Isaiah 41 and verse 10 says, don't be afraid for I am with you. Do not be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Deuteronomy 31 8 says this, do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. And we all know Psalm 23 in verse 4. David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. But see, that's what, that's what David had to come to experience for himself. That's why he starts off that Psalm 23 with this. The Lord is my shepherd. And you and I have to, co to experience life to a point to where we know that the Lord is my shepherd. I know he's your shepherd, but I know I got to come to know for myself that he's my shepherd. Is that all right? But then notice verses 33 through 40. You see what he just had with God? And God consumed this offering, and he knew it was God. See that? Notice very, the very next thing, verse 33. Do you have it? Say amen. amen. Then all the Midianites and the Malachites, the people of the east, gathered together. They crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and then he blew the trumpet, and the Abyssalites, Abyssalites, uh, gathered behind him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him. He also sent messengers to Asher and Zebul Zebulun 
and Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. So Gideon said to God, notice this, we're talking about the fact, amen, somebody, that uh, we uh, need to have faith, all right? We need to have trust, all right? Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel, and the fact that God is, he's patient with our faith process, okay? Gideon said to God, verse 36, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. Notice, and it was so. When he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me, but let me just speak once more. See, that wasn't enough. Y'all ain't getting this. Amen, somebody. God just uh, appeared to him personally. Amen, somebody. Then he asked for uh, the fleece, the, the fleece wool, the, you know, to, to have dew on it, to be soaked, but everything around be dry. God did that. Now he's going to ask for one more thing. Amen, somebody. Don't tell me that God is not patient with us. He says, do not be angry with me. He knows that he's testing the limits. But let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it be now be dry only on the fleece, but on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew all on the ground. The Lord have mercy. Now before we get upset, Amen, somebody. Before we get upset with Gideon, understand that you and I do the same thing. Do we not? And God is still patient with you and I. Amen, somebody. You say, well, I ain't asked God for all that. You don't have to ask God for all that. We go through problems. We go through troubles. And we, this time in this trouble, we're like, Lord, have mercy. I don't know if you can help me. What he helped you with the, the 10,000 other ones before. Don't tell me we don't test God his patience. But God is still faithful. He's still patient with us in our faith process to get us through. Amen, somebody. And this is why he meets us right where we are. This is why in Mark 9, Mark chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, when a man was uh, asking about the healing of his son who was possessed with demons, and the disciples couldn't heal him because they didn't have the faith to do so. Then he came to Jesus and said, if you can do anything. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe. Don't ask me if I can do anything. If you can believe. It's not on me. I can do all things. But if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I do believe, but help me to overcome my unbelief. Amen, somebody. So you see, it's not a matter of if you and I have faith, but more about the fact that we will always need the Lord's help with our faith. That's what it's about. It's, that, that, it's not that we don't believe God. We believe God. We trust God that he's able, but we need him to help us with our trust, with our reliance, with our dependence, with our faith in him to get through it. And then lastly, the fifth and final point is this. True success is determined by God's power and not ours. True success is determined by God's power and not ours. For this, I need you to go to Judges chapter 7 and the verses 1 through 8. Judges chapter 7 and the verses 1 through 8, and we're finished. Then Jerubbabel, or Jerubel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early 
and encamped beside the well of Herod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Notice why. Lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Are y'all getting this? The fact of the matter is the same is true for you and I today. There's some victories that God don't give us because we got too much going on. So God has to get to a point providentially to allow us to get to a point where we have no resources. And when God brings the victory, we know that it was him and not us. Amen, somebody. Notice then verse 3. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, notice, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. Notice this. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. Did y'all get that? So they started off, Gideon started off with 32,000 people, but when God said, you know, proclaim in the hearing of the people, whomever is fearful and afraid, let them turn and depart at once. 22,000 people left. Over two-thirds. Amen, somebody. Everybody who's in the Lord's army, amen, somebody, aren't really prepared to fight. I'll look this way. All right. Are we getting this? All right. And that's important because those who are fearful, those who are faint hearted, those who are cowardly tend to have a negative effect and influence upon other people. In other words, as a congregation, sometimes we have to be careful not to listen to each other and listen to God. Because sometimes we can have tasks, we can have goals and we want to step out on faith, and some people can say, well, nah, I don't think we can do that. I don't think we, it would be just like Joshua and Caleb with the other spies. Oh, man, we just, we're just grasshoppers in their eyes, all right? And those type of people we don't want to listen to. Amen, somebody. We love them, but we don't want to listen to them, okay? All right, are we getting this? All right, notice. So 22,000 left, 10,000 remained. Notice verse 4, but the Lord said to Gideon, the people, 10,000, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go with you. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, notice this. This is the the wisdom of God is so just wonderful and phenomenal, all right? And a lot of times, for a long time, I looked at this verse, and I really didn't understand, okay? Everyone who laps or drinks from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall separate by himself. Likewise, notice the other group. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink, all right, so notice, the ones who gets on their knees is significant because if you're going to go to some water and get on your knees in the midst of battle, that signifies that you're not vigilant, you're not alert, you're not on guard. Amen, somebody. But if you're sitting there laughing, you're still vigilant. You're still watchful. Amen, somebody. And and guess what? I don't want to be in a battle, in a war, with someone who's not vigilant and watchful. Is that all right? And I'm here to tell you, in the church, we are in a war, a spiritual war. And we ain't got no time to be getting on our knees. Amen drinking some water while the enemy is coming up behind us to club us in our head. Are we getting this? You say, well, what what does that look like? It looks like sometimes where 
uh, when we're in this spiritual warfare, amen, and we need to move forward, sometimes things happen in our lives, even as servants, amen, somebody. And guess what? We can't allow ourselves to be entangled with the world. We still have to fight God's fight, all right? Fight the fight. We can't be encumbered by things in the world. Well, I got this going on. I can't, I can't do this. I can't do that. Well, guess what? Just stay at home then. Just stay at home. You ain't fit for this. All right? Are we getting this? All right? God needs spiritual warriors, not spiritual wimps. And I don't mean to be insensitive. I don't mean to sound condemning. But that's the truth of the matter. This is a war. And it takes men and women, amen, somebody, who are vigilant and watchful. Are we getting this? Notice verse 6. And the number of those who lapsed, who lapped, put in their hand to their mouth was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees. Are y'all getting this? To drink the water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, by 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. 300. 300. 300. And when you go into chapter 8, you'll see that it was 300 against 135,000. You see, God has never dealt with quantity. Let me say that again. God has never dealt with quantity. God doesn't need quantity. He needs quality, faithful. You have so many today worried about how many members they got. How many members? But how many are faithful? That's what really matters. Amen, somebody. I'd rather be in a number of faithful of 10 than in an unfaithful 10,000. They're just looking for appearance and all these other things. And I'm not here to say that I'm the judge of people's heart, but God knows. And God has already told us, few there be that find it. Amen, somebody. Jesus said, fear not, little flock. Always giving us and helping us to understand that it's just going to be a few. But with him, if God is for us, who can be against us? Is that all right? All right. So the question is, when it, we talk about success is by God's power, not ours, whatever success you and I are working towards and building in our lives, spiritually or otherwise, is it with the Lord's power and authority? Let that seek in for a little bit. Whatever success you and I are working towards and building in our lives, spiritually or otherwise, is it with the Lord's power and authority? Whatever successes you and I are endeavoring so hard to guard and protect in our lives, is it with a complete faith and trust in God? You say, why, why do you say that? Because Psalm 127 and verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So the point is this as we close. Accomplishing the purposes of God is not determined by the bottom line on a finance sheet not determined by the size of our congregation, not determined by the efficiency of our so-called intelligent plans, even though we need to attend to all those things in some capacity for sure. The truth of the matter is God is looking to glorify himself on earth through his people who absolutely and fully are dependent on him who trust and believe that he's with them. God doesn't need our approval for that. Amen, somebody. And the truth of the matter is, he doesn't need us at all. All right? Yet and still, he invites us to join him 
in doing his will. And when you and I do so faithfully, we reap the eternal benefits. But most of all, most of all, he gets the glory. He gets the glory. Philippians 2.13 says, for it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And then Isaiah 43, 7 says, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Stop looking for meaning and purpose in your life because God has already told us what it is. It's to glorify him. It's to serve him. And it's to worship him. Amen, somebody. I've said enough. If you're here tonight and you've not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want to extend to you the greatest invitation ever extended to men. Amen. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The question is, do you believe it? If you believe it, are you willing to repent of your sins? Confess that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And then in obedience, be baptized for the remission of your sins, for the forgiveness of your sin, and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you're willing to do that tonight, you can be added by the Lord himself, Acts 2.47, to the body of Christ, the church of Christ. And for those of us who have obeyed the gospel, amen, somebody, let us always be mindful of the fact that we have been called out of fear, not again to, to the bondage of fear. We've been called out of fear and unto faith. Let us live by faith and not by sight as we together stand and sing the words of encouragement. Now.